you say things are getting critical, are you talking about something to do with the vehicles that are in the ring so Saturn? Yes, yeah. Really? Yeah. So I was behind closed doors for some time, and my clearance was way, way, way above top secret. So can you tell us, are you able to tell us your title when you were working in, in this uh, sort of division behind three doors? No, I had probably three or four pages of titles. Oh. Uh, I don't know which one I'm going to land on. And, uh, and uh, uh, I can tell things, when I mean things, uh, the conditions uh, are getting critical. And I find that some scientists also think that. And so I think when uh, I do publish, uh, that group anyway will agree with me full-heartedly. It, it, people have got to be made to understand that those things are real. Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot. We are here with Norm Bergram. He was with NACA, which was the early precursor of NASA. Yes. And he also worked for Ames Research. He has also worked for Lockheed Martin as well. And uh, no, it's just Lockheed. I left Lockheed before it turned Lockheed Martin. Oh, wow. Okay, we're going back in time here. Okay, that's okay. That's all fine. <laughs> it's um, got to be accurate. Yeah, yeah no, know. you're Somebody absolutely right. Somebody me on that. He was say. an employee of Lockheed? Yes. Okay. Before it was Lockheed Martin. And he has written a book called The Ringmakers of Saturn, which is why we're here. And uh, let's see, it looks like you got another book here too, well, that right? That was a precursor, uh, a very early one. Okay, I'm going to show these to the camera so that we can make sure to get the... I have not read your book, Ringmakers of Saturn. I'm, I'm hoping to get a copy and read the book because I, I have heard it's, it's fabulous. Uh, and I apologize for that. It was a little pricey. Um, for some well, reason. Well, you better get it before it goes up farther. Yeah, it has actually become something of a collector's item, but it, it, I... Yeah, and uh, when I publish the next time, it'll be like $1,000. Oh, my God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, I've already sold one that uh, where I certified my signature, I certified the book, $250. Really? Yeah. All right, well... So that gives you an idea. We're I in mean, the presence of a, of a semi-celebrity or a celebrity in the scientific community, I guess, in a certain sense. I've been around quite a while You've in been the around. scientific community. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so, so to, to kind of start off with, how old are you? Do you mind saying? Well, I always say, would you like to guess? <laughs> no, I've heard you're around 80, but I don't know. No, uh, in six weeks, I will be 91. Oh my God, wow. And my specialist says, I think you can make 100. Well, you are amazing because you look great and I had no idea you were that old. Yep, uh, I work as hard now as I ever did. Wow. Uh, uh, I don't have enough hours in the day for me. Awesome. And uh, I'm making a change where I'm gonna be able to have more time for me. And so it's a very significant thing. I won't be here the next time you come here. Oh, you won't? No, I'll be hidden somewhere else. Oh, hidden yeah. in an underground base doing no, it, it's top a very, secret? No, it's just a very nice place, but uh, it's, I will not be easy to get to. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've had my stuff stolen here. Have you? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going in for... You don't know where I am. Incredible. Okay, well, that's very, very interesting. And right now we're in Los Altos Hills, and we are actually in your home. And thank yes. you very much for having us here. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, my wife and I always enjoyed it, um, and I designed the whole it's thing. It's a lovely area, and it's a lovely home. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and it's been very exciting trying to get here. I've actually, uh, I wanted to interview you almost a uh, year and a half, two years ago. Yes. And unfortunately at that time your wife had passed on. Yeah. And uh, so you took some time, uh, obviously. We're on our way to the Sacramento UFO conference. And uh, so this was right on the way. Yes. 
And so it was very kind of you to, to let us come into your oh, home. I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is have you introduce yourself and your background, because obviously I've been getting a number of things wrong. Because uh, <laughs> Well, you got it right uh, now. And um, the point I think you're interested in is how did I ever get interested in this? Well, I've got lots of questions, but, but we could definitely start with that. But first, before you do that, what I want you to do is I want you to talk about your background. I want you to talk about sort of how you made your career progress, I guess you would call it, in the scientific community. Okay. Um, well, it was at the time of the war, and I was with Douglas Aircraft. And I was on the drawing board uh, designing turrets for... Uh, uh, fighter airplane and uh, it had to be heated then um, a department manager showed up one day and he asked my boss is there anybody here that would like to come up north I need somebody bad fast that, that's essentially what it amounted to and he said yeah check with Norm and uh, I'd heard so much great things about being up in the northern parts, more rural and down in the south. And so uh, we said yes. And I went to Ames Laboratory. When I walked in the door, I was immediately an assistant project manager. Uh, and uh, when that happened, uh, at that point, I was just a plain mechanical engineer. Uh, it, with some administrative things that uh, Cornell was able to give me. Um, but I was told, you never use your feelings here. You use data. And that has stuck with me all my life. Uh, don't use your feelings. And uh, uh, you, you've got to nail something down. And, all right, so the project that I got on then was uh, the beginning of the uh, determination of how you design an airplane with thermal ice prevention. Uh, what the equations are to govern how much heat you have. Uh, this required uh, flying around in icing conditions and we measured drop size, temperature, and how much water was in a cube of space. You had to analyze uh, the, what was going, the, the, the cold, the effect of cold on, on airplanes? Well, um, there were two purposes. One was uh, to be able to have some airplanes fly over the Himalayas safely. And that's, that was the first application to airplanes. And then the second was uh, to, to be able to build a, uh, icing wind, an icing wind tunnel. And that was done in Cleveland, Ohio. What uh, year for, was this? Oh, golly. Um, Approximately. Oh, 1945 was when they started to build, I think. The flights were mandatory, and what we had was a sort of a dummy wing mounted amidship uh, where we could adjust the heat on, on this model and uh, determine exactly how much heat it took to get the ice that you saw there to go away. Uh, oh, I see. Um, there were some precarious flights. Uh, what about flying in the Antarctic? Did you have to fly, or did they do any tests down there? I think it's probably safer to fly in the Antarctic than it is where we flew. Oh, really? Yes, because that it precludes formation of large drops. Uh, if you have large drops, and they freeze, you're in bad trouble in an airplane. Oh, so it's, it's the medium cold that is a problem. Yes, see, that's why we that's made the temperature, you see. One of the, I, I got to tell you this story, is that 
we flew from Laramie, Wyoming, to Salt Lake City. And in between there, there's a range of mountains, mm -hmm. but there's a cutout, you know, so that it, you can go through there at low altitudes. Mm -hmm. um, this particular flight, I could tell from the instruments that I had, which were virtually the same as the pilots, uh, that, uh, hey, we're losing altitude. I've never seen an altimeter hand spin like this. It, it just went around like Oh, wow. You know? And uh, the airspeed stayed up for a little while. And then it began to drop. Mind you, we were flying at like 150 indicated speed. And um, so it got down to 100. And uh-oh, uh here we go. And uh, stall was like 92. We hit 93. Wow. And at that point, the pilots had poured on all the... Uh, power to the engine they could get. The hand for the uh, temperature, the piston rings were in the red, which you should never fly an airplane like that, but we did in order to get out of this downdraft. I see. And, uh, so that's the kind of thing we went through. Wow. It, and, and why did that happen? Was it just the, the, because it had this down sort of uh, area of the, between the mountains? or We would have crashed know. had we been over to the right or to the left. Uh -huh. uh, we had an airline pilot, a United Airline pilot, that knew all these routes. And that's precisely why he was chosen. I see. So that uh, we would have as safe flight as possible. Uh, and, um, yeah, we would have intercepted, no question about it. Very, very interesting uh, to, to go back in time this way. Uh, let's fast forward a bit. Okay. Okay. And you went from, from studying this and from dealing with this and, and had exclusively, I'm assuming, to do with, with normal uh, airplanes, right? Not, not, not rockets or, or going down to space. Not at that space. point, right. Not at that point. Okay. So at what point did you kind of move into the, the scientific area dealing with... Um, I don't know, did you go to, from there to Ames? Was it Ames or was it uh, NACA? Well, you see, I was at Ames all the time I did the icing work. Oh, you were. And I did some stability and control work. Okay. Particularly as it related to the role of airplanes and if they would go unstable in a role condition. And I found conditions where they would. Um, and so... We had a situation with the test uh, vehicle called the X-17, I believe it was, uh, where they spun it up to try to keep it stable, but it, they were testing the warhead. Uh, and it was uh, a, a flight where the head would go Mach 15. Uh, and um, Okay, so I was able to back out the uh, reason for it, and it had to be that um, the the missile, was, the material in it was just off enough. It's sort of like a, a tire that was not properly balanced. It would whip. Mm -hmm. and it just whipped. You know, so you just, had to know all of that. Did you also have to know uh, things about weather? Because um, eventually the rings yes. of Saturn, I, the, I think maybe the, the there's a link is yes. here. Uh, on our flights, we had uh, a professional meteorologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the pilot, the meteorologist, and I always looked at the weather patterns. And during that time, I got acquainted with a number of other uh, meteorologists, and they told me how they thought weather appeared just come out of nowhere. And uh, uh, I found that very fascinating. Hmm. And uh, anyway, the meteorologist and I wrote, a, a joint report on on the meteorology of icing. Oh. And uh, so... So you had that background as well. So, okay, that was at Ames, correct? Yes. Uh, you see, we knew the icing program was going to come to a close, so a bunch of us proposed flights at Mach 15. And lo and behold, one fellow went down to the newly opened missile division in Van Nuys. And he wrote me a letter and said, Norm, you won't believe this. They're doing just what you guys wanted to do. And uh, 
here's an application, and he says, fill it out. Uh, this is where you should be. And I did fill it out. Uh, my pay went up by a factor of three, mm -hmm. and um, uh, at one point where we had this instability of the test uh, for going Mach 15 down there, uh, the the head of the project was so impressed with how simple it was to fix this that I became uh, one of his favorite guys. I uh, see. Okay, so at that point you're working a little more in when you say the missile area, but was that that was still? I mean, we're still talking about here on Earth, right? Yes. So. Yeah. How did you make that transition to no looking problem. at... No problem, no problem. The equations are the same airplane-wise as a missile. Okay. And, uh, as a rocket as right. well, right? right? Yeah. So did you, did you I, I mean, I, I'm really not sure, but did you work at, on the shuttles? No. No? No, that was after. That was later. Uh, yeah. That was. So what was the politics that created, went from NACA to NASA? Because you must have been around right during the transition, right? The idea of space was coming into the picture. And NACA was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Uh -huh. So how do, you, how do you fit it in? Well, we'll just invent another organization, and we'll call it NASA, National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration. I see. So they get both of them. But, in there. but in a sense, when you were at NACA, because you wrote the Ring Makers of Saturn, so at some point you were already looking out to the stars, right? So if if this organization was just called National um, Aeronautics, what was it um, organization? NACA. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Advisor. Okay. Yeah. But they were dealing, they had to go into space before it became NASA, uh, didn't they, deal with space? The only one that went into space before it became NASA was the, the, the missile I worked on in Van Nuys. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Where did the missile go? Where was it supposed to go? Were you shooting it somewhere? Well, see, we were firing it from Cape Canaveral, and out over the ocean and make sure that we didn't land on any land on in there anywhere. Right. Uh, uh, but, um, no, that was, that was really the early years. Okay, so you're, you're working for NACA. When did you write the book? Uh, I wrote it in 1981, I believe it was. Had you left NACA when you wrote the book? Um, yeah. How long? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't. Approximately. When did you leave NACA? I guess it was like, uh, it had to be uh, Lockheed in this case. I think it was uh, 1659, something like that. Wow, uh, so you wrote Ringmaker Saturn a couple years, you know, like 20 it, it years later. The Voyager, Voyager 2, um, had finished its flight. And I had Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 data. And that I inspected and studied for quite a while. And that's when I wrote the first book. And I was so surprised at what I found that it took me like the four years to, to get the book published because I wasn't sure that what I had was really right. And so I looked in many articles and books to see, oh yeah, this sort of fits what they're talking about there. Okay, you're okay, so publish it. And uh, so the book came out in 1985. Okay, and that's The Ringmakers. That's The Ringmakers. But the other one, this one. That's 1971. I had left Lockheed uh -huh. uh, at that point. And... Um, so I was down at Santa Cruz on a vacation, and uh, one day I spotted a real bright light in the distance. And at first I thought it was a, 
a helicopter with the sun shining on the windshield. Um, I was laying in the direction of the sun being from my back, and I was looking forward to look at the uh, this bright image. And finally, I decided, hey, that windshield couldn't shimmer like that. And I ran and got my camera and and uh, and shot some pictures. Uh, that was uh, really a convincing time for me. Um, so was that a UFO? What we call a UFO? You know, when it comes to calling things UFO, I, I part ways with people. Okay. What, what would you call it? Uh, it's an IFO, because I named it. Okay. Okay. Well, did we build it? Pardon? Do you, did we build it? Did, did, who built it, the craft? I don't know who built it, but uh, it, what I found out is these things inhabit Saturn. That's, that's where I first discovered them. And they're proliferating. They're now Uranus and, uh, and Jupiter. Wherever you see some rings now, why... Well, that's one of these. You see the craft. Yeah, I call it a ring maker. Yeah. Okay, you call you call it a ring maker. Yeah, S and I can say it's electromagnetic because I can identify uh, streamlined patterns with respect to it that I knew were what we call potential lines, and um, and that that says it was electrical. Interesting. Well, so the craft that you saw in Santa Cruz was the first sort of precursor of, the, of your kind of giving you a heads up, is that right? Yeah, and then um, for this book, I believe, um, it was simply a picture taken out over these mountains. Uh, the object was over the ocean, but it was um, very bright, exceptionally bright. And, wow. uh, so did you look at the sky with a telescope, or were you looking at the sky with just your naked eye? Just naked eye. Uh-huh. But you saw these objects. Yeah. And did, did you talk to anyone about that? No. You didn't? No. And you just decided to write your book? Yeah, there were 26 copies of those. I don't know where the other 25 are. You're kidding. <laughs> yeah. You wrote 26 copies of this book? Yeah. There was how many were printed. And you know? there's, wow, this is really a collector's item then. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, you find one, why? I'd like wow. to get it myself. Okay, that's, that's fascinating. This is a interesting. Yeah, that's where I got the idea that there were streamers from these objects. And, um, or I couldn't have drawn that, okay. I see. What do you mean by streamers? Well, you see those. Yes. I mean, it's actually arc. looks like art. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. I call those streamers. Mm -hmm. um, what it, I mean, do you know what that is? I can tell you what in our physical terms they would call it. They would call that pinched plasma. Oh. And it means it's hot because it's plasma. I see. And because of a certain speed and all this kind of stuff, it comes out pinched. You know, it's a certain condition. Uh, when I saw it, uh, it was though on the top of the cylindrical object, uh, the color of those streamers was what I call a nauseating chartreuse. Really? Yes. It, it was really the na most nauseous chartreuse I have ever, ever seen. Um, the closest color that would match it is chlorine. So you see this plasma sort of off, coming off the object. And this is with your naked eye? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I well, mean, you must have a very unique way of looking at craft, uh, obviously. Uh, I can't say it was, that was completely the case. I did get my binoculars by this time. Oh, and, okay. And that was helpful. Um, did, okay, and you filmed it as well, did you see? Well, just stop, you know, uh, uh, just still, a, a, still. You have some stills. Are there stills in this book? Uh, 
Well, of course, the uh, ring major of Saturn is all government shots, mm -hmm. and they are stills, and these are stills. So. But, but any of your own? Uh, only Tamara Technology, they are mine. Oh, are they? Okay, interesting. Um, uh, so, and so at this point, you're talking about having been in Santa Cruz and seeing a craft, inspiring to write the first book, I guess. Yeah. And that was about what you said, 1979 or 71. when? 71. 71. Yeah. And then what happened after you wrote the first book? What was the reception to that? People <laughs> take it. And I'd never get it back. I'd loan it to them. I'd never get it back. Um, they just disappeared fast. I see. Um, what kind of people would take it? I mean, were they other scientists? Yeah, by and large, yeah. By and large. Because, yeah. Would they, were they um, employees of NASA at that time? Uh, by then, NASA was formed, right? Well, it's just people that I knew, my colleagues here and there. Uh-huh. Um, uh, okay, so, so you went from, from Ames, NACA, and then, then to, to Lockheed, yes, right? Yes, yes. But at that point, when you went to Lockheed, was it, was it turning into NASA at that point? When I left, uh, the answer is yes. When I left um, NACA, you know, it was only months when uh, Before it NASA, became NASA. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, and why did you leave NACA? Um, well, I think it was because... Um, the fellow that sent me the app uh, thought I should be down there. He said, hey, this is the kind of thing you've been doing there, and it, you should be here. Uh, and he was so right. Oh, so the organization that sent you the application from Southern California was Lockheed? The fellow that sent me the application formerly worked at Lockheed. I see. Yeah. So was it Lockheed Skunk Works? That you ended no, up? I, no, no I, I haven't been in there. I don't. You haven't? No. Do you never met uh, Ben Rich? No, I I have never met him. I have met some guys that have worked in there, and okay. they've told me stories about that, but I never met him. So the division of Lockheed back then that you worked for was it top secret or was it just uh, in the public domain? Um. When I worked at Lockheed, I had documents that were indeed top secret. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I, went for th through, I went through the first generation of the Polaris Underwater Launch Vehicle. And then I got tapped to go behind closed doors. Oh, you did? Yeah. And I was there for... Until uh, I got claustrophobia. You got claustrophobia? Yeah. yeah. I had to go through three doors to get to my desk. And, um, and this is in Southern California? No. Uh, it turned out to be up here. They moved. Oh, Lockheed, because I know Lockheed was in Sunnyvale, right? Yeah. But it started out down there. I see. And then, um, So I was behind closed doors for some time, and my clearance was way, way, way above top secret. Okay. Um, you know who Bob Dean is? Yes. Had you ever talked to him one-on-one? -on -one? I've talked with him, yes. Um, he believes what I put here is, is yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. And I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just wondered because he has a pretty high, he had a pretty high uh, above top secret clearance at one time. Mine was above the President of the United States. Oh, was it? Okay, and so were you working in an underground base up here at that time? No, it was just a place that uh, you would know how to get to. Really? I wouldn't know how to get to? It's, uh, you know, it's... If you stumble around enough, you can find it, but I it wasn't all that big a deal. But, um, 
So, so were you, I, was this the kind of thing where you signed the non-disclosure, you say you had to go through three doors to get to your... Yeah, I had to sign my life away for 30 years. Wow. Is it still in effect right now? No. No? So could you tell me anything? No. You can't? Mm -mm. Why? What would happen? Uh, I'd prefer not to find out. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right, well, let me, let me ask you. I, I mean, I know we're kind of jumping around here, but you, you're certainly piquing my curiosity about some of these things. So were you over, was Lockheed over by Moffett Field during yes, those days? Yep, yep. Okay, that was a pretty fast yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I was born at Moffett Field. Hospital. Oh, you were. Yeah, I was. Um, there was. Uh, were you there at the time when the Macon went down? The what? The Macon. The Macon. The, 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 the Zeppelin. The, the the dirigible. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I was very young. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so there was a, a dirigible that that went down yeah, that in Moffett Field. You know, it's in that housing that is being stripped off of the top of it now. The hangar. The hangar. Has a lot of history. Yeah. Um, so did you ever see any UFOs out there? Now, let's go back on this and get that straight. I'm sorry. Out. Okay. Uh, yeah, because... Whatever you, you call uh, them. Um, you see, when you say unidentified flying object... You're right. You're absolutely right. You, you can't go anywhere with that. Okay. The only reason I see that people like UFOs is for that very reason, so I can keep in business all the time, uh -huh. because it's unresolvable. Okay. Now, that's so you've my... identified it. But when you resolve something, uh, it, you know. Okay. But if you were in above top secret, let's say you might have seen some craft in those hangars. Is that right? Uh, it was my first clue that there was something in space that was different, okay? I was handed one day a set of data. The guy that gave it to me said, nobody else around here has ever been able to get anything out of these data. And if anybody can, you can. And so I went through it, and I found this one spot of data that really looked interesting. And I slugged through plotting it up. It was quite a difficult test to to uh, to draw the the picture of that. Mm -hmm. And when I got it, um, you could tell it was something strange. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, so well, so let me ask you this: uh, Can you tell me that you actually saw these things? Um, on the ground at all? Were they in location? I didn't at that time. Um, I I have seen one on the ground in Antarctica. You have? Uh, not personally, uh -huh. but an image of one which I wish I had cut out. Right. Um, so no, the, these things could come in real low. Yeah. Um, they're all sizes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same deal as airplanes. You know, they're cubs and, and all that kind of thing. You know. Right, and so the, when you're talking about the craft in the rings of Saturn, you're talking about something huge, right? Yes. Much bigger than, than we could even conceive of, I understand. Um, what is, it, I, I don't know, what, was it 70,000 yeah. square feet? Um, I could... In looking down on the rings, I could see parallel lines crossing the ring, all the rings at once. Mm -hmm. That's about as long as you can get them. That's incredible. But I, I could tell that those lines demarked the outside of an object. Mm -hmm. And that's how I came up with the scale I present in there of different lengths of these things. Okay, so at this time, though, you've written the first book and you're you're working above top secret you say you got claustrophobia and at that point you hadn't written ringmakers of satin that's right Have, had you start to stumble on some of the information that eventually i, went I, into the I book? didn't start anything with uh, a book until 
after Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 flew. Okay. But did you, back in those days, you already were sort of clued in that there were... Exactly. That's why I started looking at anything I get a hold of. Uh, and this turned out to be just 35 millimeter slides that uh, Caltech had released to to the public distributor down there. Uh -huh. And so I got just these small little slides. And uh, But you, at the time that you got that, you were not employed with anyone, correct. is that right? Yeah, I was on my own. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I knew eventually I had to do that. So you see, so, so you you're, are you sort of saying when you say you got claustrophobia? I don't know what that means. Do you mean that you became sort of tired of working at uh, in this above top secret area? Yeah, no, not tired, um, and it was very exciting. I got to see everything that went on all over the world. Wow. Nothing much has changed. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I don't know. How or were to... you threatened? Were you, you know, what did, what did you, what what did you have friends who were leaving the employee of uh, of Lockheed at that time? I mean, was there some incident that happened that made you want to leave? No, uh, it wasn't that. Uh, let's just say that you're confined to one room, day after day, year after year, same walls, so ah. forth. That's claustrophobia. I see. Uh, but I knew that, hey, there's something going on out there. And, and see if you can't, can't find it. And ah. So I in other words, on a certain level, you wanted to go beyond the confines of what you were studying. Yes, sure. Um, and I made myself a policy. Um, it's got to be all government images. No shots by me or any other person. Okay. Because what happens is that if you say, oh, let's say I, I took the picture. What film did you use? What shutter did you use? Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. That is never questioned when, they have a, when you have a government picture. Okay, but have you heard that NASA alters their their footage coming from the moon, et cetera? I, I know some of the things they do with it, yeah. Okay, so even their footage is not always dependable, right? Although I guess it's dependable to begin with. It's just that they start altering it later. Um, I have been told by a very reliable source. He asked me what... Uh, what camera did I get that image from on the moon? I said, Hasselblad. And he said, that's right. Um, he, he says, um, I thought we darkened that enough to, that you wouldn't find it. Fine. Oh, yes. So you were finding things that they didn't, they thought they covered up. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. That must have been a lot of fun. And this guy says, well, I suppose you want me to go out and tell everybody about that. I said, no, I don't want to embarrass you. That doesn't make any difference to me. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. I'm just saying I found what you saw. OK, uh, what about the Mars footage? Um, the people that look at that, I wonder sometimes how in the world they can say what they do. Because you, you can find a lot in that footage. Oh, yes. No question. Um, so do you, have you got your own photographs that you got from the government that you then were able to, you know, sort of look at and, and keep in sort of pristine condition? I'll tell you, at this juncture, I don't know what I have. I finally went to put it in a vault that the people claimed 
you, nobody can get in here, including the government. Um, but unfortunately, somehow, somebody did. Oh, really? Yeah. And what they do, is like I have some of the laptop, some of it's just on disks and so forth, they garble it. They run it through something and they garble it. So it's no longer... And sometimes there's just nothing on there. And I know that there should be something, and there's nothing. So um, I don't know how much of the early stuff I can put together. Uh, what I do know is I can put together it any time. Okay, so Just I, I don't need what? that old stuff, you can tell people. Really? You know, I don't need it. Because you know, you're, you're familiar with the landscapes, you know where things are. I know where, yeah, I'm familiar with the landscape, I know, uh, I know pretty much what's going on. Okay, so, well that's very tantalizing. Uh, so at this point, you, you learned quite a bit, you were uh, very respected, I imagine, when you left, um, even above top secret, right? You left employee of, of Lockheed. In good terms or not good terms? Um, yeah, I was respected. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when, on the Polaris vehicle, mm -hmm. that when, it, when the missile was fired off, it didn't light up and it came back down and hit the submarine. And, uh, and I said it was the umbilical plug. And um, the head of the project said, ask me, what do you think it is, Norm? And I said, it's the umbilical. That's the most reliable thing there is on the burn, Norm. It can't be that. And um, a, a Navy guy came in later, and I said, it's the umbilical plug. But Frank is not going to believe it unless we pull that thing up and we got the whole Navy out there, I don't see why you can't pull it up. And if we don't pull it up, the Soviets are going to do it. Mm -hmm. He said, Norm, focus your, synchronize your watch with mine. Three minutes, you're going to have a call from Frank. Um, three minutes, I had a call from Frank. He says, Norm, you're going to be really excited. They're going to pull up the bird. And it was the umbilical. And after that, um, if Norm said it was a certain thing, don't argue with him. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, can you tell us, are you able to tell us your title when you were working in, in this uh, sort of division behind three doors? Mm -hmm. No, I have probably three or four pages of titles. Oh. Uh, and I don't know which one I'm going to land on. And, uh, um, I think it's, what's going to happen is that I'm just going to have to find the images that I that I can get that uh, either aren't affected by anything, or I get some new ones of some sort that will sort of govern how, how this whole thing goes together. Uh, I am very aware of uh, uh, Sagan's principle. When you make big claims, you have to have big data, you know. Uh -huh. And that's the, that's the big thing about it, uh, that uh, amassing enough data that, you say, oh, it's got to be true. There's so much of it, you know. And it takes a long time to, to put together that kind of story. Right, but you've been working on this whole idea for a long time. It's up here, all right. Yes. Um, but I haven't been able to get anything much down on paper. Uh, I spent two years with my wife before she died, and two years getting straightened, things straightened out afterwards. So there's four years in there I've lost. I see. And um, uh, I can tell things, when I mean things, uh, the conditions uh, are getting critical. And I find that 
some scientists also think that. And so I think when uh, I do publish, uh, that group anyway will agree with me full-heartedly. On your conclusions. When you say things are getting critical, are you talking about something to do with the vehicles that are in the rings of Saturn? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You see, it, um, it's sort of simple. Um, on on the that's a lot of energy. Right. And okay. And this is this is the ring, right? This part, this is the ring? It, it, that ends up being the ring. Yeah. And it's it's and there, hot plasma. Oh, really? Okay, so, and they're, what your theory is, they're man manufacturing it. Is that correct? It comes, that's, that's the exhaust from this thing. From the craft? Yes. Is it because, are they stationary or are they moving, the craft? They're probably moving. So do you think, when you say things are getting critical, are you okay, saying... Okay, uh, just take that picture and say that's the exhaust. It's like you have an airplane with an exhaust. Mm -hmm. It's in your atmosphere and it can load a lot of energy, you know? And, uh, um, but this is... Saturn, like John Lear says, you know, Saturn is the, is the focal point, and I can't agree with him more. Okay, but John Lear talks about Saturn actually being portaled into another dimension. Well, you know, I he's theorizing. Yeah, so you don't necessarily go there. I, I don't go that way. Uh -huh. I, I either say, this is the way it is, or I, I can attack it. Okay, but you're saying things are getting critical because I'm really curious. Are you saying that those craft are coming here? Is that why it's critical? No, well, I'm saying, in, the, in effect, if they do, and it, there's a good probability that that is possible, uh -huh. then, hey, you've got to get with it. You can't wait around. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you see... No one really in this country accepts the concept <laughs> that at Saturn those things are there. Right. As you can't do it at Saturn, or else, you know, it, you just can't have it. It, it. People have got to be made to understand that those things are real. Right. Now, there are two images. We were taken by the Hubble telescope of, of Saturn this last year, 2012. Okay. That shows objects under the rings and one just right to the edge. Like I said, they were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that Cassini? Is uh, that our. Did the photographs come from Cassini? Uh, the last ones, no, no. The ones I told you about the, that shows those. Right. Those no. are Hubble's. Those are from Hubble. Yeah. But am I wrong? They closed down Hubble, right? Uh, well, yeah. Or that's the official but, story. Uh, right. Wherever they closed it down is 2012 before they show you the picture. It's 2012 before they show you the picture. What do you mean yeah, by and, that? And I was able to tell that before 1985. Yes. So you were way ahead of everyone. I'm way ahead. Yeah. And um, that is too long to tolerate that kind of science. Mm -hmm. It's just too long. Now, I have three reports, uh, I guess, uh, on the environment, let's say, in UNESCO, uh, but they're Yathic, 
all three of them weigh 18 pounds or about 6 pounds each. And they have to vote on what they think goes on. That is not science. <laughs> They have to That's vote. Oh, they, okay, yeah, That's you're right. Yes, absolutely. But they, if they sell it, sell it to you as though it's science, it is not science. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that is the hump that you could help get us over. Okay. Hey, those things are real. Right. Okay, but there are, if there are craft, there are beings. Um, Okay, people have asked me uh, about, I call them vehicles, okay? Right. No, I did not call them objects. That was too neutered for me. Okay. Um, I had a Stanford professor said, you ought to call them objects, no, they no. They have all of the qualities of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. They can move. You know, they're just like a missile or anything like that. So that much we can say about them, for sure. Okay. So I'm calling them in. Okay. Okay, somebody comes along and says, well now where would you manufacture one that's two and a half earth lengths long? And um, that's a hard question to answer. However, if you think of it in terms of it's a living entity, it's a it's just another kind of thing that we've got in our universe, and it can grow and grow and grow and grow. Okay, uh, so, so it can be an MV and it can itself have life. Uh huh. So, are you not positing the idea that they, those vehicles contain, you know, beings who are, you know, maybe like us? Yeah, I only go along with garment images. And if you want to know about people kind of thing, um, there is the ship that picked up the Voyager uh, capsule um, at the uh, Alameda uh, Naval Shipyard, and they they have a picture there of um, I think I think it's uh, the Apollo. Flight the, the bugs and uh, and Neil were on, uh, but anyway, there is one image there that shows black people getting off. So people with dark skin getting off. Not dark, black. Black skin. Really black. Yeah. Were they tall? Yes. Very tall. Yeah. How tall? Do you know? Well, they got up the uh, the doorway. I don't know how high that is, but well, what the safe, uh, safe seven seven feet would be probably a conservative estimate. Um, have you heard about Clark McClellan's uh, statement about that? No. Oh, you haven't. No. Have you ever been in touch with him? No. No. Uh, I have tried to stay independent and not be affected by others' opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, I would rather have what I present clash with somebody else and see who wins. <laughs> okay. And, and, and settle it that way, mm. rather than, than make a, a shoving match over it. Sure. Uh, I learned at Ames that the longer you shouted, the more probable it was that you would get your way. And I, I don't want to go through that routine. Okay, well, good for you. So you're saying it's a, what did you say, five million dollar billion? Four, four, four billion. billion. Yeah, so, so that's, that's an estimate of what, how valuable he thinks all of this is. I see. But he doesn't get any support. Right. 
See? Interesting. So you think that Obama would like to find out more? Oh, yes. He would like to keep NASA operating? Yeah, he would like to. Really? Yeah. Okay, and you know that because... Well, I know that he has a friend there at the head of NASA. Oh. And he would like to have him look good and so forth. So he would like to see some things go on under his watch. But it's not happening. Do you know who's preventing it? I think it's the overall economic picture that's preventing it. I w was in public policy in my organization, uh, my professional organization, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And um, uh, I've been on Capitol Hill and visited the various congressional offices and uh, trying to point out to them uh, what we felt was important. We made a list of ten items. And Such as? What, what would be an example of something important? This ring makers mm -hmm. of Saturn? I mean the vehicles? Oh no, this is way out in left field. Oh, so okay. not even that close, oh, Go no. not going in that direction? No, it's like you got to protect the, the doors of the pilot's compartment because of uh, terrorists, you know? Oh, that. And, okay. I mean, just practical things. I see. And, okay, um, the budget for aeronautics has gone to practically to zero because space has swiped it because it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. And you just try to juggle money around and it, it's it's a it's a strange place back there in Washington um, but it's a big education to uh, try to do some public policy okay well that's that's pretty unusual to have a scientist that tries to do public policy when you you called yourself um, I kind of I don't know if you consider yourself aeronautics engineer I, I just say I'm a scientist engineer Okay. Uh, you, it's hard to be a scientist without being an engineer. Okay. And when you say training for just an engineer, I don't think that's going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that shows to me how little understanding there is about that educational aspect. Um, did you ever go to Stanford? Mm-hmm. You did. Did you graduate from there? Uh, I got, I got a quarter in, and then my dad passed away, and he was supporting me, and that was the end of that. But it was long enough to be an alumnus of Stanford. And, okay. Uh, uh, the other interesting thing is that um, Ezra Cornell uh, and Leland Stanford got together on the founding of Stanford. So for many years there's been a close relationship between the two. Oh, between Cornell yeah. and Stanford. Yeah, and uh -huh. so... Rather than making Cornell my home university, Stanford definitely is my home. Okay. But to get back to the subject at hand, with regard to the rings and regard to what you've seen, and when you wrote your book, what was the response to the book when you, were, when you published it in the, in the scientific community, at mm -hmm. Stanford, at, you know, these places? Uh, I would say practically zero. No reaction? If it is, I never found out about it. Uh -huh. um, I think, I think only now are are they beginning to listen, and it's come around this way. Um, I was in early April uh, given some uh, fruit. Uh, and the person that gave it to me had bringing over followed up fruit for a number of times when we had lunch here. And uh, this one evening, I decided, well, I'm going to cut a little out of that apple. It looks so bad anyway. And I took about two cubic inches, out of one cubic inch on one and another cubic inch out of the other. And uh, that was about 11 o'clock. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, I really began to feel ill. And uh, I even called my son who lives in Tracy. I said, this is a heads up. I said, I'm beginning to feel really ill. 
and he, you ought to come over. And uh, he, he didn't make it over. I felt I was getting so ill, I called the neighbor next door to take me to the hospital. Wow. I was just going downhill like that. Incredible. And I'd never experienced that. That was an attempt on my life. Mm -hmm. The specialist that, uh, that I have, um, he had one question for me. He said, Norm, what triggered this? And I said, I think it's the apple. Does that make sense? Yes. Wow. So, so we, he we had a theory it. already. He, and he, you know, he's a prof of internal medicine and He's one of the smartest ones I've ever run across there at the hospital. And um, so... You didn't happen to have a piece of that apple analyzed or anything? Uh, oh, it was all thrown. I threw it all the way down, down the drain. But um, anyway, uh, because of the nature of, of the happening, and the kind of question that he asked me, um, I saw him about a week ago, he, uh, and he, um, he says, you know, I've spoken to a physicist about people, about, about some of your ideas. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Now, through through the hospital, because of what has happened, that caught their attention. I see. And when you say because of what has happened, what has happened? I almost lost my life. Okay, so you almost lost your life. But why is, in other words, why do you think they're focusing on you suddenly? You know there's a movie out called Promethe Prometheus, right? Uh, I can't say that I do. You don't know that. Well, there is one. Um, and I talked to Richard Hoagland. He said Prometheus is, well, first of all, there's a moon in Saturn called Prometheus, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm told that there's some kind of interaction between that moon and the rings. Well, sure. There's no question about it. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with him. And there's some... And you say there's something going on now. It's it's, it's becoming critical. Is is how you're terming it? Yeah, it's uh, it's much more prevalent than what we saw in 1985 or a little earlier. Um, Meaning, there's more activity on Saturn. Do you think, or just more activity around this? question about the rings and the and the craft in the rings. No, there's actual activity. There is. Uh, you know, to start off with Uranus, which is one of the pl other planets, um, did not have rings. That's right. But now it does. Right. See? And so that kind of thing is going on. And we really ought to get to the root of it. Okay, do you have a theory on why Uranus suddenly has rings? Well, sure, it's the exhaust just like... Uh, so, that, that's how I think the attention is being obtained. And um, so, well, I, I would expect something to happen a little bit. You would? Yes. When you say something to happen, what are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that Stanford Let's say, well, let's look into what Norm's doing. Okay, but you just told me you were going to be leaving here and going to kind of a secret location. Mm -hmm. have, they, have they asked you to come back in to work for them? No. No? Nobody has asked me to come back. Um, fact is... Um, as far as my own professional organization is concerned, uh, it does not fit at all with with their objectives. Uh, How it, is it different? It's too controversial. 
your two con your your theories you mean now look this is not a theory when when there's data if i propose right. something that that is a theory okay so your your data or your yeah. conclusions yes conclusions your conclusions yeah. are too controversial is yes. what you're saying yeah okay yeah they don't, um, they don't want to get involved in that but and, if there are, as you say there are new rings around uranus and there's other activity on other planets too isn't there in the solar Jupiter. system Jupiter and what's happening with Jupiter it's getting rings it's getting rings okay and are you seeing are you seeing craft there as well vehicles as you call them I haven't identified craft but I can tell you that where there's rings there are <laughs> these things so so we have these ring makers yeah. and they create tremendous energy yeah can you tell us more about what you think is going on there? You've got any ideas along those lines? Well, um, let's just take one that there was this, what do they call them, far lookers or these psychologists? Oh, remote viewers. Remote viewers, yes. right. That's what I'm. I just did an interview uh, with somebody there. Uh, which one? I had heard that there was one that saw something out there in the rings, and they were mining the rings. That's true, yes. Okay. Uh, I think I read her book, and she couldn't see anything from the side, but when she looked from uh, the top down, why, that's when she saw things. I see. Uh, I happen to have been able to uh, uncover what she saw. Really? Yeah. And what did you... I know? would say, I don't think they're mining the rings. I was, I think they're nursing from the rings. Oh, in other words, you think they're using the energy to power their craft. Yeah, they're, that's where new ones are getting their energy. New, oh, new vehicles are getting their energy? Yeah. Um, you know, you start out small, just like a baby, and then they get bigger. Oh, right, because you say that you believe they're, they're sort of like alive. Do you believe they're plasma vehicles, what's called a plasma vehicle? Have you heard that terminology? Well, I've never heard them called plasma vehicles, but um, I can understand why somebody might say that, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't make a big deal over that. Um, okay, I've heard that, that the vehicles out there use, the, they actually fly close to the sun and they, they power themselves up on the sun and then they go back uh, into I am, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. I've, I've noticed some go in there, um, and it means that they're capable of withstanding those high temperatures. Yes. And uh, so, True. Uh, yeah, they could get pumped up really nicely. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so, well, we have a very active scenario out there. Yeah. And you say it's critical. When you use that word, critical, that kind of sounds impending, like there's something coming to Earth or coming at us. Well, you know, when I read that the universe is expanding, I say, the universe is expanding. You guys are just saying you have objects out there that you use to, to say the universe is expanding. But how about supposing they're increasing their speed? They would appear that would appear like what you're saying. And if if something out there is moving faster to get away from something else, uh, we may have a critical situation. Okay, very interesting. So something out there is moving faster to get to get, get away from something else. What would that something else be? It's hard to say. Uh, now here I do have a hypothesis. Oh yeah. Yeah, 
the Big Bang, I think my hypothesis is that there were the good Nicks and there were the bad Nicks, and they had a fight. A Big Bang ensued. I see. A Big Bang, a really Big Bang. And, uh, so you think the sort of multiverses are a, a, a result of the collision of, of sort of um, light and dark, so to speak. How, how, how did you say that again? You think the multiverses are a result of the collision between good and bad or light and dark. Well, now, multiverses, what are you... Well, that's my point of view. In other words, I don't think there's just one dimension and one universe. I think there are multiple dimensions and multiple universes. Did you agree with Einstein when he said there were at least five dimensions? Uh, well, I certainly will agree that you can have almost any number of dimensions you want, okay? Um, uh, I, I take a, a little different view. Uh, my son suffers from a malady in which he hears voices. Oh, yes? And I'll tell you, um, I think that's a universe right there. Okay. Right under our nose. Uh-huh. Uh, when he first came down with this, we had a blackboard in the end room there. It was, it was four by eight feet. And uh, he wrote equations of space on there. He did? He did. Did you, were you able to yeah. ascertain if they were valid in any way? Uh, you didn't need to, I didn't need to know all the details. I, I knew enough to know that hey, those are strange equations that you wrote uh, you don't write that kind of equation here on Earth. And you do have some distance parameters in there. And I'll tell you, I was really scared. The fact is, I raised the darn board because I wish now I'd have kept it. But I was, I was scared. I was frightened at the time. Really? Yeah. What were you frightened of? The fact that he could write that stuff that he was getting an input so he could write it. Yes. That's what scared me. Um, so, in other words, who it could be coming from was yeah, the yeah. unknown intelligence uh, type of yeah. idea? Yeah, so we have talks about, about that quite frequently. And um, um, it's, it's just another aspect of all this. That is, that is a universe, all right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And it's not the kind that uh, normally you'd think would be, but it, I'll tell you, some of the things he tells, they sure are real. He can describe things down to just the last detail. Sounds like somebody I'd like to talk to. Uh, he would say no, no way. He wouldn't? Yeah, he wouldn't do it. Um, uh, is he a scientist? No, but he uh, he came within uh, a semester of getting his bachelor's degree in chemistry. I see. And um, he was our brightest. When he was oh, four or five years old, he wired up a a train set. <laughs> so that I I still am amazed that that he did it all by himself. He had the cars switching around and all this. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, well, wow. Okay, this is so fascinating. Uh, let me ask you, you still use this word critical, and I'm still trying to figure out where you're going uh, with that. Um, I'll tell you when, when I get the book written, I'll tell you tell you what it is. Right now I have a gut feeling, okay? Okay. That always proceeds 
um, things that are going to happen. I've done many analyses with, hey, I got a gut feeling that that's it. See if it is it, and I'll be right. And you'll be right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, you're someone whose gut feelings are something to pay attention yeah, to. Yeah, it's a gut feeling right now. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, let me ask you, are you still in touch with the scientific community? Do you consider yourself, or do you consider yourself... Um, out on the fringe. H how do you feel about that? Oh, by definition, I've been out on the fringe ever since I left Lockheed. Um, uh, that's the way that, that definition goes. Um, and uh, I had been uh, director at large of our um, San Francisco section, uh, not San Francisco, but the region, of AIAA that included six states and uh, AIAA. What is uh, that? American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. Okay. And um, the idea was to keep Norm active and also let him float around amongst the sections and so forth, and, which I did for a while. And uh, I got to seeing that. Hey, it's running pretty good, and um, where I saw that uh, they're reinventing the wheel, you know, that's that's when I stepped in with it. You know, I, as a staff staff person, you know, I, I kept a lot of stuff, and uh, so I've been asked to step down from that job because the regional director is going to leave it. And so I welcomed the invitation, and, and uh, so he will be quitting also. Uh, so that does leave me sort of... So you mean you've been doing that up to now? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. They've actually had you active in that organization, kind of overseeing oh, things? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, um, it wasn't much, but... Uh, when you read what's going on in Arizona and Washington and so forth, it takes a while to read all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so, well, l let me ask you. I mean, you know that NASA has been sort of a front organization. I call them a front organization for the secret space program. <laughs> Um, I don't know about being front. Well, when you say, f when I say front, I mean, if you have an organization that deals with the public, interfaces with the public, and also misleads the public on certain, certain things, by doctoring photos, by, you know, covering up certain things, by only releasing certain things, that's a front organization, isn't it? Okay, all right. I guess you're entitled to do that. Okay. Um, um, so if, if we were to look at the situation a little closer and, and find out who are the insider organizations, certainly Lockheed would qualify. Do, would you say that the defense industry are all in the know? No. No? No. Mm -mm. Uh, and Lockheed only recently has been getting images themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, having worked there, um, I don't think there'd be anybody that would be capable of doing the kind of work I have been doing. I, I, I just don't, that, that kind of talent does not exist these days. Uh, well, when you were an above top secret, you must have had people reporting to you, right? No, I was Mr. It. What does that mean? Were you Dr. It, Strangelove? I mean, what were you? Um, by it, okay, here, here's some data. Uh-huh. Tell me what it means. So you were the go-to guy. I was a go-to guy for, you know, whatever they handed me. 
I took it apart. One of my reports went to Kennedy. Oh, yeah? Do you think that Kennedy was killed because he wanted to uh, reveal things they didn't want out there? Uh, I don't know. We had a fellow that was from headquarters, and that occurred while we were all behind closed doors, and uh, they were completely dumbfounded about it all. They couldn't figure that out at all. You uh, mean what couldn't they figure out? You mean why could, he, that why he was killed? Yeah, yeah. Why or how? Even that. I mean, they. And it's still a mystery today, to a large extent. Uh, but um, anyway, it was interesting to hear stuff, opinions from headquarters from a headquarter guy. Hmm. Um, so, so they were stunned by, by Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, they were, yes. Even no behind closed it. doors, yeah. as you call it. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. That's very interesting. Well, if you were to look at the, the time when you were behind closed doors and you left on good terms, you say, right? Yeah. Did other people leave at the same time you left or did people stay there? Oh, they stayed there. Um, I was proselyted out. What does that mean? I went to work for a, a, a firm that had started up. A, a fellow was a nationally known aerodynamicist, and he founded his company, and uh, uh, he wanted to grow it, and uh, he attracted me to say, you, you can give yourself whatever name you want, uh, we're going to try to expand my company. Um, the thing was that uh, he also had on his board of directors a, a professor from the Stanford Business School. Okay. And it seemed to me like, you know, here's the chance, Norm, for you to grow. And, um, uh, but things did not work out for either of us that way. Um, do you know why? Yes. Why? Um, I did come up with uh, something that they could do. It required the services of one of the gents that knew how to program the computer. And that was the advantage of the outfit. They, they said, I can, uh, it can handle any size computer that there is. And, okay, so the day came and uh, this fellow's name, the owner of the company, his name is Jack, and Jack called a fellow in and says, uh, Norm's ready for you to program something. Jack, uh, I'm going to have to think about that. Uh, can I tell you over in the morning what, what my decision is? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, think it over. Next day came, he says, Jack, I can't do it. Uh, I am an aerodynamic specialist, and if I do this other, I ruin that. It's a no-go. Oh, how interesting. Uh, yeah, that was his attitude. And you check around, and the good guys still have that attitude. Right, that they don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to be uh, sort of tarred they, they, with they've the same chosen, brush. You know, their route. The straight and narrow. Yeah, yeah, you come along and deviate them. They, they That's can't pack it. Very interesting. Um, and so uh, that's when we parted ways. Hmm. Uh, um, but uh, it all has been a, a great learning process. Um, but you went out on the circuit and you did talk about ringmakers a bit because yes, there's a I couple did go of videos. Out for a while. Yeah. And geez, I read an article just recently where somebody comes up and says, uh, "We can get to the nearest uh, star system." You know, I gave a paper, one of the UFO organizations speeches, and I told exactly how you'd go about it then. And. Yeah. And so now, you know, it comes along, I, oh, for Pete's sake. Um, and you did what, back when? When was this? 
Oh. In the 80s? Well, it had to be after 85, mm -hmm. 88, something like that. Um, so are you, um, you know, I have so many questions. Uh, are you, would you say time travel is possible? Um, there's the way to do some of these things that has not been considered. Uh, You know what Mach number is. Okay. okay. Um, Einstein got together with Mach one time and asked him, how do you set up stuff in a reference manner? I'm faced with that, what I'm doing. And Mach says, y you get a, a, a reference. And speed of sound is mine for aerodynamics. And I can just see Einstein walking away. What's the biggest number I can find? You know, speed of light. Mm -hmm. you see? All right, so uh, it had commonly been thought that you can't go faster than the speed of light. Right. It has commonly thought that you couldn't go faster than the speed of sound. I say, hey, wait a minute here. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You know, I found like 16 samples of where astronomers measure things going faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, see, now there it sets up a new regime. Okay. Okay. So if, in other words, you're kind of alluding to the idea that if you're going faster than the speed of sound, we go into the area of time travel from that point on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. however you want to mechanize it. Um, okay, what about these vehicles in the rings? Aren't they going faster than the speed of, speed of light? Oh, I don't know. Um, I've never seen one, you know, in that condition. Okay. Not at all. Well, let's say, uh, is it possible, I mean, I don't know how you want to classify this, but if those craft, or some of the craft, the smaller ones maybe, leave there and come here, isn't that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Okay. And is it possible that they've been coming here on a regular basis? I don't know about, about that. Um... Uh, I'd be in better shape to to know about what you're asking. See, now you're asking questions that are downstream from... I understand. And um, I'm not there yet. Okay. What about, um, I'm still, you know, I mean, okay, let me, let me ask you this. I remember that John Lear told me that you told him that you saw here in, I don't know, it was on the 101 going around somewhere around Palo Alto or maybe Los Altos and you saw a what was what looked like a very low fly, flying jet that was a hologram and you determined it was a hologram in some because it actually I guess disappeared off so <laughs> well that uh, story is almost almost correct um, I was just with this fellow Jack at the time uh, and I don't know whether you know where Gunn High School is over here or not, but we were in that vicinity, and all of a sudden there was this huge-sized airplane that flew over there. It looked exactly like an airplane. Mm -hmm. um, I said, Jack, did you see that? Said, yeah. Um, but, you know, it was below the allowable level. Yes. And there were no complaints. <laughs> so <laughs> it had to be a picture, you know. Uh, really? But did it disappear suddenly? Well, it, it was only there, just fresh. You know, you know, you just got to, if you weren't looking, you'd miss it. Really? Yeah. But it has to be going very, very quickly then. Yeah, it was. So 
you determined that it was a hologram. I didn't determine it. It's just the fact that uh, there weren't any critics around here that says, hey, there was an airplane flying below allowable levels and we gotta, we got to do something about that because there are a lot of people like that around. And, right. But there were, were none, so okay, so it had to be. So that's, that's okay. What, what year was that? Oh, I don't know. When I was with Jack. Approximately. Would, would this be the 80s because you left? Mm. Didn't you leave Lockheed right around? Um, well, you wrote um, this book in 71, um, so. You know, you, you can go on the net and look at my resume there mm -hmm. and pick up pick numbers. Pick up exactly. Yeah. Okay, but, but I was just wondering in terms of your recall, when you left the employee of Lockheed, because it was too claustrophobic, as you said, and then you went to work for this guy, Jack, and that, how long did that last before the computer guy came in and said he couldn't do the programming? I mean, that must have been a pretty short time. Well, I think it was like a couple of years. A couple of years? Okay, yeah. and do you know what a Cray computer is? Yeah. Okay, and would you say that was the level of, of what we're talking about, programming a Cray? Or oh, it, it, this could have been done with a much simpler computer. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay, have you ever dealt with a Cray computer yourself? No, I, I haven't. But you know of their, yeah. of their yeah. sort of being around. Uh, okay, in terms of this, again, this critical time that we're in, can you describe this time? Like, what, do you, do you see something happening in these times? I mean, obviously we have critical things in terms of, you know, the world politics and economics and things of this nature. But when you talk about critical, I'm actually seeing something uh, to do with space. Are you talking about, um, for example, you've heard of, you know, incoming planet, like, the the second sun I, I don't know if you believe this is a binary s solar system do you do you follow that theory at all um well i guess the most critical thing i can see is that the a lot of ice is leaving antarctica yes and that indeed will raise the sea level okay and that indeed will cause some problems in many places. And it'll have a negative impact on real estate uh -huh. if you own property. <laughs> Water, yeah, oceanfront yeah. uh, property. That, to me, seems like a no-brainer. Have you talked to some remote viewers? No. No? No. Um, Other than, than the story you said about the woman yeah. who looked down on uh, the rings. You know, that's interesting mm -hmm. that somebody has that capability. Right. But it's not something that's acceptable scientifically. Okay. Okay. Well, the craft, again, the vehicles in the rings, you don't think they're mining, but you think they're using the energy to power themselves in essence. Well, when you say power themselves, um, well, I, power the entity, I, the vehicle. I, you know, I, the objects that I saw were very small inside the ring, and they were connected to the inside ring. Um, and it just seemed to me like, oh, hey, these are babies, you know, and. Uh, that's how I came up with the idea that they're nursing from the ring. You know, they're getting life, strength, and whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think that they, that's how they are growing, is using the rings. Um, now, in terms of, of mining, think about that level of thought. Mining is something that we do here on Earth. You don't have to be very bright to do mining. <laughs> okay. How do I know? Because I have worked in a mine. Okay. And um, 
so we're dealing with lots of smarts, and I don't think they, I mean, this is too low for them. Mm -hmm. My knee is too low. All right. So on, on two counts, I think uh, what we got there is a life form. Absolutely. Uh, do you believe that we're communicating with them? Have you had any evidence of oh, that? Oh, no, no. No, you know, we are not capable of doing that. Um, you know, SETI has tried to communicate with extraterrestrials, and they haven't done it yet. They have chosen the type of person, the type of entity that they want to communicate with is somebody that knows how to build radios. <laughs> right. That constrains them in their thinking yes. immensely. Right. Okay. Well, okay, uh, but but of course we're Project Camelot, and we talk to people like Richard Hoagland and so on and so forth. And we, I don't know if you've heard of Zachariah Sitchin, yeah, and his his theories. Uh, he passed on recently. Yeah. Did you know him by the by the? I met him. Yeah. You met him. Yeah. Did you ever talk about your theories with him, or um, your conclusions? No, we didn't have that much time. Uh, it was more interesting listening to what he had, <laughs> uh, what he came up with. But there's a case where uh, he's got some real solid stuff, and and but nobody wants to pay attention to it, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, Richard Hoagland just recently said to me that he thinks there's he's seen cities in what? those rings. Cities. Cities. He's seeing cities in the rings of Saturn. Well. Richard has seen cities in lots of other places. Right. Uh, I would not call them cities myself. Okay. Um, now, I don't know specifically what he is talking about. I mean, you know, if you want me to be specific, I'd have to look. Right. But... Um, He's thinking again of, of something like San Francisco or, you know, he looked down on it and there's a city, you know, it was laid out. In well, I'm not sure how he's characterizing, you know, we didn't yeah. have a chance to talk about how he's characterizing this idea of a city. In other words, it could be constructive, some, some, some uh, it, sort of plasma. Yeah, he, or he could, put that label on and what I do think he's seeing is is organized structure of some sort. Organized structures, yes. I mean, there's lines going this way, and then there's perpendicular to say. And, uh, so in a sense, you would agree with him in that. Yeah. I mean, there's that kind organized of thing can structures. There, there can be the straight rings. lines out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and any, almost any formation can be made that uh, is desired. So... If he sees a checkerboard kind of thing, and that's a city. It's not a city, but that is a checkerboard kind of thing. Um, uh, when you talk about plasma, do you, what are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, the same thing that Wilhelm Reich would be talking about when he talks about orgone? Or is plasma like another stage of orgone? Or about him, but there is one f uh, flight out to Saturn where uh, the instrument flew by the ring. And the idea was uh, to sense the plasma in there. It had a wide frequency range, and it turned out to be plasma. And... Uh, so it ticked, and they knew the speed, and they knew the time it took to pass the ring, and so they knew how thick it was. Uh-huh. Uh, and now that was a plasma indicator. Okay. So it has been measured that indeed there is plasma rings. Mm -hmm. But you read also where, oh, this is a bunch of broken up moons that got there, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, there's confusion in their storytelling. Uh-huh. Um, 
But the, but the rings that are suddenly appearing around Uranus, these are not broken up moons, right? Um, you know, all I can say is, you know, the rings are there, and my interpretation is, by inference, I see the rings, uh, so somewhere there's a me and me, and they're never where you think they're going to be. Do you, uh, have you thought about the idea that, um, I guess I talked to Sean David Morton, who met you years ago. I don't know if you remember Sean. Mm -mm. Sean David Morton, he's a sort of a psychic and he lives in Southern California. Anyway, he's a friend of mine. And he said that recently they, they've actually photographed, I guess, the top of Saturn and they've seen that there's a, a, a hexagonal yes. shape. Yeah. Yes. You've heard of that. Yes. That seems to support your, your theory or your, your conclusions. That That's what he said. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah. The, any, any geometric form can be made. Um, okay. But you don't see anything. I mean, isn't there a significance to, to the hexagon in, in the Saturn symbology? Um, well, I would never expect a, a uh, hexagon there, but I have never expected to see some of the other things I've seen either, so I did want to visit uh, Saturn in the write-up I did because there are some things that uh, need to be fleshed out for people. Okay. Uh, and, and I think... If I haven't lost it on my disc, why well, I'll be able to make a nice little story about all that. Okay. If you haven't lost it, in other words, if it wasn't stolen? Yeah, or boogered up. Erased and messed mm -hmm. with. Okay. Well, uh, I'm running out of tape here again, right? <laughs> and uh, I guess we've been going for quite some time, yeah, so I, I don't want to tire you out too, too much. But is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to say to make it part of this uh, this presentation here? Um, they could um, ask me to be vice president. <laughs> <laughs> because you'd like to change the policy and, and what's going on. Yeah. And you've had clearances above with, uh, you know, above way above top secret so in a sense you they should be coming to you for advice I would say yeah, they should yeah um, well let's recommend that let's let's recommend that that they come to Norm uh, Bergram and, and one and guy in this critical not too time. long ago was bitching about the, the candidates and I said Jack you can just write my name in can't you <laughs> <laughs> He said, yeah, hey, that's a good idea. Um, did you know, I just, I just want to know, did you know Arthur C. Clarke? No. Um, you know, I, I didn't go that rude. You know, I, I have been always so much up to here, you know, sort of career-wise, right. what I've been involved in. Yes. Um, I, I haven't uh, been the social guy I should have been. Uh, Hopefully, that's going to change. Okay. I'd like um, to see that. Um, um, I'm a type that is pretty flexible. Uh-huh. Um, um, well, certainly you must be if you've done all the things you've talked about and you also are able to, you've obviously worked in areas of policy as well. Yeah, well, see, that came about by... Uh, the prof at Cornell called me in one time and said, how would you like to grade papers, law papers? And I said, oh, that sounds good to me. And uh, um, I said, but what, what do we do when I grade my, when, when it comes to mine? He says, you grade it just exactly like you grade the others, but give it to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me, he told me that, as an engineer, you really ought to get law under your belt because 
you know the nomenclature, and uh, these are the guys that are running the country, basically. Mm -hmm. And they really don't know about some things that they should, but they just do it. And um, so over a period of ten years, I, had a lot, I got a law degree. Oh, you did! Wow, that's incredible. And. Uh, uh, On top of I everything else you were doing, you got a law degree. I, I found it uh, <laughs> just exactly like the prof said, yeah. And that, that's what made it so, so easy to go in. To go Otherwise, into I wouldn't have done policy. it. I see. Okay, Nor Norm Bergram, I, I believe that there's more that you could be telling us, but I understand that you still have some secrecy or oaths. Is that, that correct? You're kind of abiding by those? Um. I could tell you a lot of war stories, the answer, you know, I, I could tell you a lot of stuff that's sort of related to all this, but uh, give me some more time and I'm set myself up so I sh don't have to make my own bed, I don't have to cook some meals, uh -huh. you know, and all this, and TV will be taken care of for me, just a lot of things will go to zero. I see. And so Norma's going to have some more time to do some things to get it together. Okay, but are the people that are making this possible going to let you go out and talk about it? Yes. Yes, they are. And I already uh, tweaked them. <laughs>